Okay, so this is Alison's presentation. Uh, it's learning by leading, encouraging ownership seminar settings. So Alison, I should probably introduce her. Uh, she's just finishing her PhD at the University of York. And uh, this is her presentation. So three years ago, when I first began teaching seminars to our second year students at the Department of Archaeology in York, a colleague of mine, David Roberts, introduced me to a scheme he'd been trying out in his seminars, which he called discussion leaders. He said it was working pretty well for him and was a good way of assigning a bit more responsibility to students in the seminar setting, so I decided to give it a try too. Over the following terms, I ended up implementing student discussion leaders in the seminars I taught in a few different forms. And once a term, that postgraduate teachers would meet with the module leaders, and David and I would share our opinions about how the discussion leaders were working out. Last year, at our departmental learning and teaching forum, after David had left York, I explained that although I'd been trialling it for a few years, I found that I wasn't really getting out, getting what I wanted out of it. It seemed good in theory, but in practice it just wasn't coming off. And so I essentially decided not to try it out anymore. Shortly after that discussion, David Altoff invited me to submit an abstract of the session he was organising on students in archaeology at TAG. I realised that I had actually, um, I realised that I actually had an interesting case study here, one that I'd have been observing over a good number of uh, different student seminars, and also that I would have one last chance to see what students, what some last attempt tweaks might lead to in the autumn term before TAG in December. So with the opportunity to turn this into a case study of mine, I decided to revise my application um, of the student discussion leaders and try it out on one last cohort. In fact, what I found in the end was that rather unsurprisingly, clearly defined guidelines and assigning explicit responsibility for a task yielded overwhelmingly positive results. And I'm now convinced that we should be implementing discussion leaders across the board in second year seminars. So what I'd like to do here is briefly introduce the way the scheme was first applied, what the main motivations behind using discussion leaders were in the first place, this is where the theory comes in, why it didn't quite work the way I'd hoped, and then how I reworked the idea and its implementation with greater success, more theory here. Finally, I'd like to share the responses of some of the students. So, I'll start by explaining the concept of discussion leaders. The module on which we taught was called Themes in Historical Archaeology and involved a combination of lectures and seminars. Postgraduates ran the seminars that were intended to complement and solidify learning from the lectures and assigned reading. The cohort was normally divided into four seminar groups with approximately 15 students in each. Uh, the module ran in brackets of four weeks with two different archaeological time periods taught each term. This is what the structure of the module looks like, with David and I teaching the Roman and early medieval seminars in red. But there could be up to eight different postgraduates running the seminars depending on how the groups are allotted. Seminars ran for two hours per group, during which time they were, there were two student presentations on case studies and the remaining time was allotted for discussion on the assigned reading, lecture and case studies. Discussion leaders were assigned before term started, with approximately four discussion leaders per seminar. This was to ensure everyone had a chance to lead, but also because attendance can be very poor, and four discussion leaders ensured that at least one would attend. <laughs> Their role was to take charge of discussions around the reading and the student presentations. There are several reasons behind the decision to implement decision leader, uh, discussion leaders. The primary theoretical the premise was to encourage responsibility and ownership for learning. This was because we still saw students in second year who expected to be told what to learn and weren't taking any initiative for their own learning. This led to stilted discussions in seminars and expectations that seminar leaders were there to lecture rather than facilitate discussions. Other motivations behind implementing the scheme were to encourage better discussions overall. These images show what seminar leaders tend to encounter on the left, where a few individuals respond to prompts but direct answers to the seminar leader. And on the right is a more ideal scenario where discussion is passing between a number of different students and is being directed more as a large conversation than as a question and answer type. 
One idea was also that by assigning discussion leaders, we were enabling students to take over responsibility for some of their teaching. The expectation was that in their position of authority, they would feel more responsible for the reading than they were the ones asking the questions. This was based on the premise with which most of you are probably familiar, the learning pyramid. So, learners tend to retain only 5% of what they learn from a lecture. <coughs> 10% of what they learn from reading, and 20% of what they learn from audiovisual. Things that they see and hear in a demonstration will get them to retain approximately 30% of what they have learned, and they tend to retain approximately 50% of what they learn in a group discussion. But crucially, this must be a group discussion in which they are engaged. When they practice or apply what they have learned, they are likely to retain most of it at around 70%. And finally, learners will retain approximately 90% of what they have learned when they teach it to others. So the idea of discussion leaders makes use of this premise and thereby incorporates the other forms of learning used in lecture seminar teaching to strengthen learning. Finally, implementing discussion leaders in second year seminars where the responsibility <coughs> is shared between more than one student is a way of preparing them for their third year when they are expected to chair assessed lectures and two hour seminars entirely on their own. In this way, the discussion leaders fit with the overall alignment of the archaeology degree programme and enables the development of a given skill over the years. But I found that although in theory this seemed like a good idea, in practice it felt contrived and perhaps over-optimistic. It was clear that some students didn't take the role seriously, that others simply didn't understand what was expected of them, and in fact very rarely did I get the impression that the discussion leaders actually felt responsible for their or their peers' learning. Another problem was that shy students who, are, who were assigned the role of discussion leaders would tend to remain silent if they knew that another leader was more likely to talk and take control of the situation. So when I reviewed what I had been doing and how I might try to improve the scheme for the seminar groups in the autumn term, I came up with a few notes. We were aiming to encourage ownership and responsibility, but somewhere along the line there was a miscommunication about what we specifically expected of the discussion leaders. We wanted students to lead others, but with four leaders, more often there was awkward silence as one waited for the other to step in. This problem also worked to do the opposite for the confidence of the shy students than what was hoped, and they felt embarrassed. What I decided to do was revise my expectations of the seminar leaders and tailor them to better suit what I had learned about the, our students. I didn't want to go too far towards spoon-feeding them. Uh, but in fact, I had a responsibility to effectively communicate the objectives of this scheme and to be explicit about our expectations. Along with this, I decided to be explicit about what we were implementing the discussion leaders, why we were implementing the discussion leaders. How, how was it going to benefit them? So I explained, and in fact many of them did not, know, did not yet know, that they, were, they, that they are expected to run their own seminars in their third year. I made two more revisions. I decided to allot only two discussion leaders per seminar and to divide their roles so that one opened the seminar and led discussions on the reading and lecture, while the other took over the second half and ran discussions on the presentations. To accompany this, I compiled a short list of prompt questions for each seminar and made them available online. I, inv I invited the discussion leaders to add their own questions as they did the reading and as they listened to the presentations. The theory behind this uh, was tied into enabling responsibility for learning through key objectives. If we look at the ownership model for student learning proposed by Conley and French, by providing clearly defined goals, students should be more able and willing to assume responsibility for accomplishing them. This leads to improved confidence, where students feel comfortable to not just retell what they know, but engage with the subject and think on the spot, even if it is challenging for them. Ideally, this leads to persistence and the desire to improve, which cycles back into motivation and the initiative to continue to take ownership over learning. My seminar students this term really caught on to the idea, and while I still had a few problems, overall I was impressed with the initiative they showed. 
When they came prepared with their own questions to ask, they led on concepts, linked themes across reading, and directed discussion to include those who didn't speak as much as others. Best of all, because, they, because there was only one leader responsible for each part of the seminar, there was much better attendance because they felt that now they were vital to the seminar structure. I think the most important factor in this improvement was the fact that I was explicit about their responsibility. There were no uncertainties about who was in charge and who should be speaking. At the, at the end of the seminar, uh, at the end of the final seminar, and with my groups, I asked them to tell me how they found the discussion leader roles. They were invited to comment on ways in which it could be improved, if they thought it should be scrapped altogether, or if they thought it would be valuable for future groups. The response was overwhelmingly positive. Some said they were reluctant to do it initially, but knowing that they needed the practice anyway, they were happy to do it, and would even prefer to have some opportunities to lead, to lead discussions in order to improve. Others who didn't get a chance to lead said that they were disappointed. This is one of the shortcom shortcomings of reducing the number of leaders to two per seminar. I asked them about providing set questions for the discussion leaders and whether it was too much like spoon feeding or whether it was helpful. And they suggested that one or two prompt questions with the expectation that leaders should so come up with their own was an ideal format at this stage. The idea had always been that that little extra work should be involved in the role beyond completing the expected reading along with everyone else. Finally, they suggested they would prefer to see it actually written into the module with details of discussion leaders alongside the presenters and not just communicated through email. They liked the idea of all seminar leaders, not only David and I, running the discussion leader scheme in order to provide continuity and give them a chance to keep practicing. So final thoughts. The ability to lead is clearly an important skill in most situations, and linking the ideas of leading and learning is by no means novel, as any quick Google images search will indicate. These ideas are closely tied up with corporate training. But I think that this is uh, combined, but I think this combined pairing of taking responsibility for a topic and for a group of peers, and in this way learning both about the subject and about leadership, is invaluable to archaeology students. This is, in fact, a way of learning through experience. Not everyone is a natural leader, but by providing students with the opportunity to develop these skills and explicitly handing them the responsibility for a group of peers, I believe we can encourage increased ownership and initiative as both learners and leaders. And that concludes uh, Alison's presentation. So.